So first of all, hello and welcome. Um, as you can probably guess from my accent, I'm not Danish. I'm actually Austrian. Um, so if you want to practice German afterwards, that's fine as well. But of course, you can also ask me questions afterwards. Um, for everyone who's looking currently in the GoToGuide app, um, there are two things I'd like to mention. One is, you might notice I changed the title of the presentation. Um, that's primarily because um, things have changed in the AR space so dramatically that when I decided on the title two months ago, um, this is basically entirely outdated. Um, so doing a little bit different uh, session, I have kind of a conceptual AR part and a technical part. Um, and like Jason said, things are moving super quickly. So I call this now Go New Realities Go. Uh, the second part I want to mention is um, you have this app where you can rate me, basically, and my talk, and please make use of that. I'm super interested in how you think this talk went. If you think it was crap, please give me a crap icon. I'm totally fine with that. Uh, then I know I have to do things differently. Uh, if you think it was good, then correspondingly give me a, a thumbs up. I know it's late. Um, it's the last session before the evening closing keynote. So I thought about what can I do to kind of keep you awake and on the last day of the conference. And I thought, on one hand, it might be the presentation itself. I hope you're going to like that. Uh, but I know for a fact, and if you look at me, and I, I'm definitely an expert, uh, that sugar helps in keeping awake. So I brought some sugar. Um, and we'll come back to that in a, in a second. Um, so let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Philip. As I said, I'm working at the company called Wikitude. My role there is being the CTO. Um, for that, I own product and technology, um, or the technology team, in a way. Um, I have a master's uh, in computer system engineering from a uni university not so far away from here, in Halmstad, Sweden. Um, don't ask me afterwards to talk Swedish or Danish. Uh, the only Swedish and Danish I know is from stupid drinking games. Um, and I used to work for uh, a company in Austria called 3United which was then acquired by VeriSign, a US-based company, and later on as a product manager and innovation manager for T-Mobile Austria, before switching to Wikitude seven years ago. So as I said, um, the topic or the agenda, what you can expect now for the next 40 minutes, is a little bit different than uh, what it was in the, um, in the, in the guide. Um, I'd like to give you kind of what I call the state of the union on AR. So it kind of wraps where we're currently standing uh, AR. It should give you an idea what AR kit, AR core, kind of where this all fits in. Uh, and the second part will then be a little bit more technical. I'm going to show you how you, put, for example, can code AR experiences in JavaScript um, with our framework. Um, my intention is not at all to give you kind of a, a product advertisement of our product. Um, of course, I know it best, so I will re reference it quite often, but I think, um, or I hope that you don't get this as kind of a product advertisement for the Wiki SDK. And there will be some time for questions and answers. So, uh, the company Wikitude is a startup that has been founded nine years ago, at least back then it was a startup. Um, we're located directly in the city of Salzburg, uh, which you can see here. So in Austria, um, currently our size, team size is about 30 um, and strongly growing. And um, Salzburg and the city of Salzburg is primarily known for three things. Um, the first one is Sound of Music. And I know that everyone in the US knows Sounds of Music. I have no idea about Denmark. Who knows Sound of Music? Okay, good. I'm safe. <laughs> so the scenery and the, uh, Salzburg is the scenery and the location for that movie. Um, fun fact, no one in Austria knows that movie. It's not a common movie. Um, I saw it the first time when I was in the US. Second thing Salzburg is uh, famous for, um, on a more serious side, is, is Mozart. Um, it's Mozart's birthplace. There are Mozart's square, Mozart statues all over the city. Um, and some genius um, chocolatery um, founded or created this suite called Mozart Kugel. Uh, back a long, long time after Mozart already died. Um, and that's actually what I brought uh, with me. Um, there have been legal battles and claims about whether they are true Salzburg Mozartkugeln or original Salzburg Mozartkugel or whatever. Um, 
they're really good. Um, they will give you the, the sugar you need to sustain the afternoon. Um, and I'm not going over the English literal translation of Mozart Kugeln. Um, but you have to work for that. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions, uh, you the auditorium. Whoever has the answer right and shouts it out first is awarded with the Mozart Kugel. And I think I have three questions during my presentation, and I have a few more Mozart Kugeln with me. So for everyone who's going to ask a question in the app, and we're going to talk about this, I'm going to award another Mozart Kugel. So first question, I said Salzburg is famous for three things. Right, Mozart, Sound of Music, and then I want to know what the third thing is. And this is the headquarter of this third thing, which is very close to Salzburg. Who knows which headquarter of an international company that is? Maybe Red Bull is a very good answer, and it's a correct answer. So traditionally, I'm going to shoot at you. <laughs> I hope you're good at catching. I'm bad at throwing. <laughs> One, two, three, up. Very good. Yeah, so the third thing uh, uh, close to Salzburg is Red Bull. This is the headquarter. This is probably their smallest building. Red Bull is all over Salzburg. They own the soccer club. They own the ice hockey club. They own a lot of things in Salzburg. Maybe Salzburg is going to be famous for Wikitude at a later time as well. OK, so on to the topic. Um, you might have heard about VR, AR, and have read some news. VR versus AR, um, what is it? Different, you know, there's quite been many or quite some articles uh, recently about that. And uh, here there is another term, mixed reality, and Jason used mixed reality as well. And because I, I sense some confusion usually about those terms, I'm always kind of starting off with explaining those terms. And a pretty good way to explain those terms is using this, what they call the reality continuum, that's uh, actually pretty old. It has been kind of defined in the 80s by, by a guy called Paul Milgram. And on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side, you have kind of those extremes of the reality continuum. Um, and on, yeah, on the right-hand side, we do have reality, what we perceive as reality, what is. So nothing unchanged, nothing unaltered. On the left-hand side, the other extreme, the virtual reality, or the virtual, what could be, kind of fantasy land, right? No, nothing real happening in there. And everything in between is defined as mixed reality. So as soon as kind of you start to mix virtual content with reality and kind of attach that to a context, that is the mixed reality. Um, and then we have two other terms, AR and AV. Um, so if you kind of come from the reality side and have a bigger portion of reality and superimpose digital information, like Jason showed you, that's what we call AR, augmented reality. If you come from the virtual area and you primarily have virtual content and add some uh, real content, then it's called augmented virtuality. No one uses that term. Actually, I think it makes sense. So if you, if you think about uh, Oculus or HTC Vive VR headsets, and think about that you could have your hands as natural gesture controller, and you see your hands in virtual reality. That would be an example for AV. Again, no one uses that term. So everything in between those extremes is mixed reality. Sometimes people mix up mixed reality and say, OK, mixed reality is AR and VR. No, they're not. That's entirely wrong. VR is VR. Reality is reality. Everything in between is mixed reality. Um, so I prefer the term augmented reality because what we've seen lately is mostly coming from the reality side, and we're superimposing some information, some virtual information. But Microsoft, for example, uh, prefers the term MR. Um, in my talk, I'm primarily using AR. But for your reference, for the future, MR equals AR, basically. Um, Although VR and mixed reality or AR share the same reality part, as I said, they are totally different. Also, if you have been working uh, on VR experiences and you want to move over to AR, you need to learn it very differently. There are very different concepts. The use cases are very different. The benefits are very different. Um, so if you have, been, you have been into VR, they share some core technology that is kind of similar, but kind of the benefits and what the user expects are very, very different. Um, another slide that's not technical at all, um, but I think explains pretty well what's currently happening. Um, so this slide is from a company, an analyst company called DigiCapital. Um, um, if you are in the field of 
M-R-A-R. -R. Um, it's absolutely worth checking out their vlog. I think they do pretty good uh, analysis uh, on, on this area. And they kind of predict what's happening currently is the fourth wave of computing. So we had PC as the first wave, internet as the second wave, mobile as the third wave, and now we have this VR, AR, MR as the fourth wave happening. Um, and if you think of the previous three waves that have been there, um, they have been affecting all our lives, right? Not just a single use case, a single branch, a single industry, they have been affecting all over our daily life. Um, and that's what kind of the, the uh, prediction here as well, that AR um, or MR will also affect all our life. Um, the major companies that are driving that are nearly entirely on there. Facebook, Microsoft, Google, <coughs> and Apple. Um, this is a slide from 2016, so before ARKit has been launched. Uh, that's why I think Apple is missing. Um, but what you can see is that AR is already uh, a big boy game. Um, who knows what the Gartner hype cycle is? Or who has seen that before? Just to know what I should explain it. Okay, um, I think the minority. So the Gartner hype cycle is uh, a report published by Gartner, um, uh, the consultant company, every year. This one is the, the latest from July 2017. And they found a pattern how emerging technology kind of moves um, uh, through time. And they identified five very explicit phases innovation trigger, peak of inflated expectations, or the hype, uh, the through of the dis disillusionment, the slope of enlightenment, and the plateau of productivity. And they kind of map all the uh, technologies they see on this curve. And AR currently is here, which is a very interesting spot. Um, note, this curve doesn't have anything to do with revenue or something like that. That's just um, the expectations that are set into this. So usually if they're somewhere here, uh, on the peak of, of the hype, they think this technology is going to solve everything. It's the golden bullet for everything. Um, and so this spot is pretty interesting because it's kind of the spot where before it kind of goes into mass market and proves whether this technology actually sustains in the market. There's also a shortcut to this um, cycle, which is very often overseen. This shortcut goes like this is like no relevance at anymore. <laughs> Drops off from the market, shows, doesn't show anymore in the market. Um, this could still happen to AR. I don't believe, I think AR is here to stay, but it still could happen to this technology. And if, if you're interested how this looked like 2016, very boringly, AR stayed there where it was. Also, VR basically stayed where it was. 17, 16, oops. The only, thing, the only thing that changed was um, the time. Also, and I think to, I, I'm showing this to, you to kind of put AR into a context or in a frame for you. Um, I agree with when this is going to reach mass market adoption or mass market, um, yeah, mainstream adoption, five to 10 years. I think we're still very early in AR. Um, and I'll show you a few other parts. So now back to Arnold. As an Austrian, and the AR, I have to show you Arnold. Uh, there's no way around that. Um, but I'm showing you this for a reason, because sometimes AR is referred, or the things that you see are referred as Terminator vision. And that's from the very first movie, Terminator 1, um, where the Terminator, you know, just before entering into the, into the bar, is kind of scanning the area, or it's afterwards, actually, I think, um, and is identifying this object. So the thing that you see here is actually quite advanced. Uh, I think we couldn't do that in a proper way at the moment because it involves, on one hand, our understanding of the scene. It, um, it involves identifying the object. Um, it includes kind of uh, a knowledge about the geometric shapes of those objects, you know, the dashed lines that you see that kind of indi uh, indicates occlusion, so there's something before and something behind the interesting object. It has a database of all the, the models, and it matches those models. That's, that's pretty advanced. Um, that's nothing we currently can do. I, I, I mean, in some edge cases, yes, but not on a, on a general purpose. Um, and here comes my second question for Mozart Kugel, um, which is about the movie Terminator. Who knows how old that movie is? What's the, oh, <laughs> yeah. What was it? That's correct. How do you know? 
I mean, how do you know in like 0.5 seconds? <laughs> and the next one is I didn't, wouldn't know that. <laughs> Thanks. I find it astonishing that this movie is already more than 30 years old. Um, and, and the creative part of, in that movie already had kind of this notion what it potentially could be. I mean, I don't think that we're super far away of that one, uh, but um, uh, at the moment, I think this would not be possible. And I kind of want to draw the kind of a timeline uh, of different projects that we've seen with AR, um, or a historic timeline, uh, all with the purpose of kind of getting across the point why I think AR matters. Um, so I'm not, going to sh I'm not showing you that in order to impress you and think, wow, this is so cool, but there's kind of this idea that I, um, this one key point or two key points, I think, why AR matters. So those were very early hardware-based systems in, in fighter planes or in, in helicopters. Um, so with a head-up display where the, the, the pilot was injected with real-time information. Um, so he could see the target, he could see uh, other things. This is already kind of augmented reality, right? We're overlaying some digital information with the real world. In this, in this the purpose is that the pilot can watch the scene in the real world, doesn't have to look on the instruments, but gets an immediate feedback of the plane and the, the status uh, in the scene. Um, then we had Pokemon Go um, yeah, last year, two years ago, um, or other projects that are very similar. Um, Pokemon Go from a technology perspective in AR is pretty weak. Um, why I'm saying this is it's purely using your location and it's not interacting with this location at all. If you're just close by, you will, get the, you will get the ability to catch the Pokemon, but it does not interact with the surrounding at all. You know, if, if, if this place would have a wall next to it, it would just not know. Um, it's a very simple approach. Um, an approach we've seen six years ago uh, in apps that are, uh, have been built with our SDK. There's another app, um, the Olympics uh, in Rio, that did a very similar thing. They showed uh, real-time information in a location-based scenario, um, as did also the, the London Olympics in 2012. So that's, from a technology perspective, that's quite simple. We've seen this, right? Uh, AR on a face, so Snapchat can recognize your face shape. Um, faces are pretty uniform in a way, all of us Nearly all of us have, have a nose, probably except for Tyrion Lannister. Um, every one of us has eyes. Um, every one of, you know, the shape is pretty similar, so um, face detection is, is a solved problem in, in computer vision. And then overlaying effects is, 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 is simple in a way as well. Um, there are other examples. Also, Jason mentioned that before. Augmenting prints, ads, packaging, uh, where it basically requires image recognition, so I need to have an understanding of the image itself. This is an example from um, MediaMarkt. I guess this is a known brand. Uh, what they're doing is, um, so their mail uh, information uh, can be augmented with this MediaMarkt app. And you see then the 3D model of the headphones plus some call to actions to go to the online store. You'll see that in a second. And what that requires is that the app itself recognizes the images the image itself, plus tracks that in real time uh, in, the, in the field of view. Um, the idea here is obviously to connect the leaflet with the online store. Um, what you also might have noticed, there are no prices on the digital information because they're kind of personalizing that. They know it's you who, are, who is looking at the leaflet, and then they're personalizing the price uh, based on that. At least that's what they have been trying with. Um, and then kind of moving into more advanced scenarios and use cases, field services and maintenance is another big thing in the enterprise and the industry. So here they help field engineers uh, to be more efficient, um, probably that people can maintain uh, and repair things that probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have been skilled. Um, those are some of the companies we're working with. Um, the same is true for furniture and home decor. So you can pre-visualize at home how this furniture is going to look like helps you save some troubles in, in arguing with your wife at a Ikea or at other store, um, or help people with not so good fantasy as I'm probably, or imagination skills, that you can look at that, whether this looks good or not. Um, that requires a different technology than one before. Uh, that basically just, you're gonna place that in somewhere, it doesn't really matter where, you as a user 
place the furniture as you like, so you don't have to have an understanding of what you're currently looking at. You just need to have a pretty good tracking or tracking. Training and support is another one. Um, I think that's, that's kind of a, a natural evolution from simulators, that you can train with the thing itself. Um, another example here is remote maintenance or getting help from someone remote. Um, this requires the user to actually wear some smart glasses or a camera that, I'm, that I can transmit what I'm seeing. The guy at the other end is obviously more knowledgeable than I am, and he could guide me through the repair process. Now, checking for batteries might not be the best example, I mean, but the fantasy, I think, uh, you don't have to think very hard to find repair processes that are more complex where you probably would not make it without some external help. Um, that's a very popular use case we hear quite often, um, and I think we'll see that more and more, particularly in the enterprise and industry space. So kind of making a step backwards from use cases to a more generic view onto AR or MR systems, and also VR system. In a way, they all, all of them consist of four parts. A sensing part, a computing part, a visualized part, and a projection part. And the sensing part, takes over sensing the natural world or the real world. Um, doing that for several reasons, uh, or for one reason, we want to understand in which situation the user currently is. Um, so that's usually a hardware, ta a hardware task, um, and it uses any kind of sensor that you have on a, on a mobile phone or a, on a mobile device. So gyroscope, accelerometers, compass, this could be the microphone, like Jason said before, um, kind of all your fingerprint to know at which time sync we currently are. The camera as a sensor, um, there are a couple of, or there are many, many sensors on there. Um, and that feeds into kind of a computing engine. Algorithms that kind of try to make sense of all this information coming in. They fuse this information and then generate some results that we hand over to the visualization. That's typically a very standard uh, 3D rendering engine, or not a standard one, but 3D rendering engines at the moment, and they output that on different front ends, um, smartphone, tablets, smart glasses, whatever. And there's this kind of this divide. Um, usually the right-hand side is very hardware-oriented, the left-hand side is very software-oriented. That's a very generic view on any of those systems. If you replace the projection onto, oh, sorry, if you pre replace the projection um, or if you think that you have a VR headset, you basically have this, this, the same true for VR. Um, if you say this projection unit is a see-through binocular glass, smart glass, you have an AR, MR system, you have HoloLens. Uh, basically, you can categorize any of those systems through that. And I think in, from a technology company in, in the AR space, all of us work towards being able to provide or enable this, what we call the perfect illusion. And all four parts I mentioned have, have kind of, or are at a certain step, and, but have some evil, uh, evolution pattern to it. So on the sensing side, I was not super accurate in terms of that this is purely hardware play. Um, sensing is, is both. Um, and in sensing, we've, on a mobile phone, we have mono cameras. We see stereo, com stereo cameras coming up. Um, they help to do a better job in terms of uh, estimating depth um, um, uh, in, in AR scenes. I think we we're going to see HDA, HDR cameras, um, similar to our eyes or, or possibilities of our eyes. Uh, we've seen depth camera with the latest iPhone X, uh, the one front-facing depth cameras. I guess we will see some technology in the back-facing world as well um, on mass market devices, not just on Tango devices. We might see radar sensors, leader sensors that are currently in autonomous vehicles that all have the goal or the objective to get a better picture, a digital picture of the surrounding. On software side, um, it's all about understanding the environment. So sensing itself is just getting kind of a better signal of the surrounding, a digital signal, if you would like to say so. On software side, it's a lot about understanding what the user is seeing. And this is an area that is not super advanced so far. We probably at the moment are somewhere here. So software can recognize predefined images. So when we're talking about image recognition, this usually works the way that you, you tell the system or you train the system a certain set of images, and this will be, be able to recognize. The same is true for objects. Or, um, shape detection, for example, is already something that I haven't seen in, in broad. Um, uh, broad adaption, um, then instead of, of 
uh, instead of recognizing a predefined image, you just define the outline or the shape of an uh, of a object, and the system can uh, then recognize that one. That's particularly helpful if you don't know the texture, the color, the uh, property of, of the object. Um, a very uh, often cited example is being able to recognize the shape of a car. Um, cars come in various colors, right, in various dirt uh, uh, scales, um, so, but you still want to be able to recognize the car itself. Plane detection is something we've seen with AR Kit and AR Core, um, still at a very basic uh, level. Um, you can track multiple planes, um, so the system will tell you, this here is a plane, it does not do walls at the moment. This one, this one is a plane that is different. Uh, it can do tables, uh, but that's it. Um, but what we actually want to reach is being able to understand arbitrary shapes. We want to give developers like you the ability to work with the entire geometry of the room. I, ideally, I would like to give you a very or a detailed mesh of this surrounding here so you can work with that and let the user interact. Um, and kind of the... The very last goal is not only to provide a mesh, but also a semantical understanding of the scene, right? Chair, chair, person, 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 TV. Um, that's something none of the, the SDKs is doing at the moment and probably likely will not do. But I think you will see some of those technologies be solved. So when it comes to computing, um, the status of 2017 is actually quite advanced. I think what AR Kit and AR Core did very well is solving this problem. Um, who knows about the term VIO or SLAM? Okay, that's good. <laughs> no one. Um, so SLAM, SLAM is short for simultaneous location and mapping. And it's actually a pretty old uh, problem postulated in robotics. Uh, the, key idea, the key idea here is I'm landing a rover on Mars or an unknown territory, um, and the rover itself has to kind of draw a map of his surroundings, at the same time localize itself and position itself at that. And this is a chicken edge problem, uh, chicken edge, <laughs> chicken egg problem. Um, if I don't know where I am, I cannot draw a map. If I don't have a map, I cannot tell where I am. So this kind of, this is the key problem uh, for that, and there are various solutions to that. Um, in context of sm smartphones, it's basically uh, creating a map of your surrounding. Um, and when I say map, it means basically identifying key points. Um, and that is super, uh, it's very computation intensive. That's why we've seen this now quite lately. VIO is also from robotics, is called, or is short for visual inertial odometry. Visual meaning I have a visual sensor, a camera. Inertial meaning I have a gyroscope. And I'm fusing those two information to kind of get a better tracking and a better what we say, pose or position of the user. The camera is pretty good in terms of detecting texture and texture uh, movements, and also if I'm moving forward and backward, uh, like our ears. Uh, gyroscopes are pretty good when it comes to rotation. Um, our, our, our eyes, <laughs> the gyro is the equivalent of our ears. And our brain is exactly fusing that information, right? Um, and is syncing that information uh, since we are kids. And VIO algorithms are doing the exact same thing. Uh, if the phone is purely rotating, I'm kind of taking more information from the gyroscope and treat that as the dominant movement. Um, if I'm doing mixed uh, movements, I'm using both information parameters. And both Apple and Google uh, have solved that pretty well in, in AR Kit and AR Core. But there will be more on that as well. When it comes to visualization, I think this is also one of the key parts that are not yet solved in a way that it's um, uh, sufficient. Jason before talked about believability, um, and we're somewhere here, right? We do have pretty good 3D rendering engines. We have physics engines that we can apply. Rendering is somewhere at 60 FPS or faster. Um, VR systems render at 90 uh, FPS usually. Um, but then there are stuff here that make object, virtual objects appear even more realistic. Artificial motion blur. So if I move, I need to have some motion blur on the 3D objects as well. Um, atmospheric uh, um, effects um, that are inherent to this scene. And then kind of the holy grail, adaptive light rendering. That is uh, a thing I haven't seen yet. Um, Apple is kind of doing that with the front-facing camera and kind of estimating where your main light source is coming from. 
um, but it's only for the face because, again, the face is a very known pattern and you can then roughly know where the main light source comes from. But that doesn't necessarily help me if I want to place virtual content right in here. The light scene is very different from my light scene currently. I think I have strong light coming from here. In the auditorium, you have very homogeneous soft light. And lighting is probably key to make an AR experience um, realistic or not. Um, this makes a huge difference. If light doesn't match with your expectation or the expectation of your brain, uh, your brain would immediately tell you this is something artificial. Um, and when it comes to projection, um, this content out to you again, or back to you again. Um, I mean, the predominant way at the moment is smartphones and tablets. There are some HMDs coming out and smart glasses coming out. OTG is one of the vendors uh, in California. Um, and I guess Apple at a later time will uh, introduce smart glasses as well. Um, Jason also mentioned before HoloLens with a very limited field of view. Um, that's super annoying. You know, if, if, if you're wearing HoloLenses, you're basically seeing like this in digital, uh, but we perceive the world a lot more around that. So that will be a next step as well. And then who knows, maybe at a time we will wear smart lenses that will inject the digital information or even going closer to the brain, have kind of a brain bridge that injects that. Um, that's all what probably will come up. Some of that might be speculative. But taking a step back um, to what are called AR 1.0, um, this is from an excavation site close to Vienna. It's called Canuntum. Um, it has been a, a Roman city. Um, and this arch here um, is like it is. Um, and they put up this AR content to visualize how the arch looked like 2,000 years ago. And I call it 1.0 because this has no digital this is no digital experience, it's a pure analog uh, experience. It's mounted on kind of a plexiglass or um, glass shield, and it's hand-drawn how this looked like 2,000 uh, 2, years ago. Uh, if you look close, there's even, it says, eye level, so you should put your eyes at this level to then get the augmentation or get how this looked like. Um, so if this already is there 30, 40 years ago and is kind of analog, um, there must be more to AR than we're currently seeing with this digital hype. And I think what you saw in the past 10 minutes or so uh, with all of them, there are two kind of two key takeaways why AR matters and might matter to you and your company at a later stage. It makes the invisible visible in various aspects. The invisible can be real-time data, real-time sensor data in your enterprise. It can be monsters and can be game content, can be anything, right? Um, and the second thing, it connects the offline with the online. So those two uh, possibilities is what the technology itself gives you uh, or can give you and your experience and might actually transform your business in one way or in, in the other. And there's one other magic keyword, um, I'm, I'm coming to that, which I think is super critical for AR experiences. What I did a few years ago is I compared um, how um, Google Maps is implemented on desktop, is implemented on mobile, and could have been implemented on AR. This is from the very first Google Glass promotion video. It never looked like this, but I thought it's still it's a kind of a good idea. It will look differently, though. So the first thing you notice is that on all those three screens for the same service, the density of informa information that you present to the user is increasing a lot, right? On desktop, a lot of options, huge screen. Uh, it's predominantly because of the getting smaller sc uh, screen uh, estate. Um, but the desktop has many options. You can click a lot. You can do a lot. Mobile already reduced, reduced options. The menus are hidden. Um, the menus that you can directly hit from the very first top level are, are reduced. And in AR, you basically don't have options at all. You only get the routing from A to B and some, some information. At the same time, um, the context this information is delivered is increasing. And what I mean with that, a guy sitting in front of a desktop, I have no idea about the location, not fully true, I, I roughly know where the guy is. If the user is not logged in, I don't know actually who it is. I don't know whether the guy is actually looking at me or, or is looking at this or not, using it. In a mobile phone, we know the location, we know roughly orientation, 
We can guess that the user is currently using that. And with AR, I even get more information because I basically have the full attention of the user. Um, and my claim or my hypothesis, if, if you add up that in AR, the relevance of the content that you deliver is higher because you can deliver it in a much better context. And there's also debate going on that if, if you build AR experiences that don't tie into a context and don't respect this context, don't build it at all with AR. It's just a waste of time in a way. Um, and one of the examples, and I'm, 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 I still don't get my head around this, why Apple did this in their keynote. I don't know, anyone watch the Apple keynote with the AR game? A few of you, okay, then I'll quickly explain it. They had a table, a wooden table, um, and uh, one guy from a, a, a game company was showing off their AR game. Um, and so this AR game basically spanned the entire table. And the guy was going around, it was kind of a shooter, tactical game, not shooter game, it was kind of a, a tactical game, right? Um, so you could deploy star, uh, starships and you had to protect your base. Um, so this guy was going around all the time, but it had no tie to this table except for it, it was there. But it could have been on any other table. So I have no clue why, why AR matters in this context. I think even they don't. I mean, the game looks fantastic, but there is no difference what I use this or I play this game on the smartphone itself, except for that I can move around that, but there is no benefit in that. So if there is no, clue, uh, there is no clear relevance or context that you deliver your AR experience, then don't do it. Then it's not kind of worth uh, doing that in AR, or you might rethink your experience. So think context for AR, how you, you get a lot of context, you get a lot of information. Context can be, oh yeah, uh, the user is currently looking at this particular image. Um, that matters a lot, and that's one of the key aspects, I think, for AR. So that was the first part. Uh, second part is how to create AR experiences in JavaScript. So we're moving a little bit into the technical area. Um, but I'm, I'm giving away my third Mozart Kugel. Um, and this device has been super important for us as a company. Um, if you look very closely, it even says Wikitude here. The palm tree was our very first app icon. I'll tell you the story in a second. Uh, my question is, what's the name of this device? One person, that's unbelievable. I even have it. Yeah? It's an HTC One Android Developer Pro One. It's also an HTC. It's an HTC phone, that's right? Uh, it was not a developer phone. This was the first commercial Android phone. The developer phone looked differently. It was also yeah, so it's the... Yeah, it's the, it, it was, as you can see, it was marketed by T-Mobile. It was the T-Mobile G1, G1, or HTC Dream, but still, I mean, who, I, I can't shoot that far. Yeah, it is. It was HTC Dream and, and T-Mobile G1. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm asking this question at nearly every, every speech, um, and... We're going to look up whether it's the HTC Dream or not. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting that, that so many people don't know this. It's, it's really a, an iconic device. It's the very first Android commercial phone. If I would put up uh, the very first iPhone, I guess 99% would say, yeah, that's the very first iPhone. People really, you, you, people really know what's the, what was the, the, the story of, of Android um, with this uh, awkward slide-out mechanism. Um, the story is that... Uh, Google um, had this Android developer challenge to boost the ecosystem and awarded $10 million to app developers um, distributed onto 100 uh, winners. And Wikitude was one of the top 20 apps uh, back then. And the prize money was then the funding for the company. Um, and as part of that, it was also pre-installed on the, on the device. Um, so that's, that's about the T-Mobile G1 and Google device. <coughs> Kind of mapping what we heard before from the components onto an SDK architecture slide. This is actually our uh, architecture of the Wikidata SDK. Um, I think it, in a way, it could, or I think most of the SDKs out there uh, have similar components. What you see as kind of the hardware layer or the base layer is what we pack into the SDK is camera access and access to the gyroscope, the IMU, the initial uh, measurement unit. 
And then tons of optimizations, code optimizations, um, for nearly all of the mobile platforms. So Intel, there are some phones and smart glasses running on Intel devices. Uh, majority runs on ARM. Um, ARM V8 is the 64-bit uh, architecture. Um, so our code is particularly optimized for 64-bit, not only that it runs on 64-bit, but it takes use of that, um, of the reg registers. And there are a decent number of GPU optimizations to make the code run in an acceptable manner. Um, because most of the CV part, the, the computer vision part, is quite heavy. Um, and that's uh, the layer on top, uh, our core components, um, OpenGL rendering, metal rendering, and then our own SLAM engine. We are integrating AR kit in AR core and kind of wrapping that. Um, there's an engine, a part that uh, does image recognition and object recognition. I'll come to that in a, in a second. There's a cloud recognition uh, part as well. I'm not talking about the plugin manager. And then there are components doing the rendering uh, with a lightweight rendering engine. Um, as Jason said, rendering on a mobile phone is a very different story than rendering on a, on a desktop uh, or for a movie. Uh, and then augmentations, that's the content that is overlaid, um, and the location-based services. Um, so our SDK runs on Android, iOS, and will run on Windows 10. Um, there are several ways you can create um, applications, but that's not the point here today. Um, the point I'm talking about is going to talk about is this, the JavaScript API. Um, this JavaScript API wraps all that, um, as I said before. Um, so we're kind of looking at this one. You're creating your experience or your app in, in this way here. Um, if you, is anyone familiar with Cordova, Titanium, or Xamarin? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, you could use those frameworks as well if you would like to work with us. Um, but again, that's not the point here. Um, if you're going to work with the JavaScript API, um, you still have to include the SDK into an app. Um, there's a very slim native uh, API. Um, I'm talking here about Android, so there's a very slim Java, soon to be Kotlin, uh, API that basically just wraps uh, lifecycle handling, so on, on create, on pause, on resume methods, and it loads an architect world. So let me introduce the term architect world. It's our own term for AR experience written in JavaScript. It's a pretty old one. Um, as Wikidude comes from geo-based, we had this term of world, um, and architect was our play on AR and creating something. Um, there are other things, but they are optional. I'm not going to talk about that. So how do we do that? How do we actually create or render JavaScript or allow people to write JavaScript and that is then displayed as augmented reality? So what we have internally are two views. There is a, a native OpenGL view that we render. Um, it renders the camera stream. It renders augmentation. But at the top of that, a standard web view um, from Android and iOS that loads the HTML file and does basically file loading and asset loading. Um, and it's kind of special because it has transparent background. So those two views are merged kind of on the phone. And uh, you'll see how that, world, uh, how that works. Um, an experience uh, for the JavaScript API consists of regular HTML files, JavaScript files, and CSS files. This is kind of what defines your experience. If you include this snippet, um, it will make the API work. This looks like a regular call to a website. Um, the, normally, the question now comes, would that work in a Chrome on a mobile phone or any other browser? No, it will not, not yet, at least. You still need to have the SDK uh, loaded. Um, the SDK will inject the content of the script. Uh, if, if, even if you call the URL, uh, you will get a 404. Uh, but the SDK loads that script uh, on the device itself and then makes this uh, experience uh, working. And conceptually, the JavaScript calls that you throw into the SDK basically execute and trigger actions in the C++ layer. Um, what I didn't mention before, everything up the hardware stack is C++. Um, the hardware layer is C++ and assembly. Uh, everything below is in JavaScript or the native languages. Like Jason said before, I'm kind of uh, nearly copying him. What can, you, what can you show as an augmentation? What can you show as content? You can show images, videos, videos with uh, alpha channels or transparent background videos, uh, 3D models of any kind, uh, web views, um, and labels. 
um, and you see the corresponding JavaScript classes in our namespace AR. Um, so we kind of have a uh, MVM or MVC um, architecture methodology uh, applied. So you have models, you have views associated, and a controller uh, to capture uh, that. Um, the models, as you see, um, correspond to the things you can do in the SDK. Um, the views correspond to what I said before, what you actually can show, and the controller then glues that together. Uh, a pretty kind of old example, but I think it explains very well the different aspects uh, you've been hearing. So in the web view, the regular web view, you can render any kind of HTML content. That's usually used for menus, user interaction, static content. Um, you can include any JavaScript library that runs on a mobile phone, whatever you want. Um, so in this case, we're looking at an application from Hotels.com. It shows um, open hotels around you. Um, and they are georeferenced. So this is rendered in the AR view, um, but still defined by you in JavaScript. And as I said, you can include any uh, JavaScript library. The project, is, as you can see, is, has already some, some years on its back. Um, it's a Java, uh, jQuery um, implementation, um, but it's, that's totally doable. So this was an example for geolocated or location-based uh, content. When we move to image or marker-based um, uh, experiences, that mark when I say marker, this kind of spans everything from very ugly fiducial markers or QR code markers to uh, natural images to objects to anything that is kind of predefined and can then be detected by the engine. In this case, uh, how this would work, you upload the reference images, uh, like those here, um, to the target management tool. You can do that in a web UI. You can do that through a REST API. Um, the target management tool then in the background is kind of creating a digital footprint of those images. Um, and what we then in the engine do, we do kind of a fingerprint match what we currently see in the camera to your provided database. Um, um, by the way, you can all try that for free. I didn't mention that before, if you're, if you're curious. Um, and I said that because in this example, in this JavaScript example, we're using what we call a WTC file or this target collection file um, to define what we're actually going to search for. Uh, the example here is uh, taken from a catalog, from a furniture catalog. Um, so we want to augment this image here in the catalog, um, in, which is, I think it was actually, um, in grayscale, and we want to overlay an, a video of how this kitchen looks like uh, with a button. Um, and what happened? Basically, those four lines uh, of code would get you there. Um, so, as I said, the first line, the tile collection resource defines what kind of images we want to be able to recognize. And as I said, we did that before and downloaded this file. Uh, you can load that remotely. You can load that locally. Um, we tell the system we're talking about an image tracker that uses this target collection resource. So we're looking for images. There are other, uh, as I said, object tracker or instant tracker. The overlay should be a video, which we call video drawable. This is uh, from a local asset uh, and rendered at 65% size. And then the trackable object is, or the image trackable is putting that all together. Um, we tell them which tracker, we tell which uh, image we actually want to be recognized, and we draw this overlay only on this image. Am I running out of time? That's good, because this is my very last slide. Um, so you can try that on your own. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, there are other uh, materials uh, on our website if you're interested. Um, this is one of the examples of image recognition. I thank you for your patience at the evening. I think no one, at least I didn't see it, uh, fell asleep. Um, and I think I have for Mozart Kugeln. I don't know whether we get four questions. But thanks again. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here afterwards, or you can drop me an email. Thank you. So I, I think we are out of time uh, with regards to questions, but you're welcome to come uh, to Philip afterwards and ask questions. One small thing. You were right about the HTC dream. I was right? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. OK, so four questions. Happy to yeah. distribute those. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.